So um, uh, this class um, came about really a few different people uh, suggested something like this to me. Um, and so it's clear to me that there would be a significant interest in this. We'll be, again, uh, going through the sitter, learning about Davni, using Guide to Jewish Prayer by uh, Ray Wolgamuth, which um, I know many, most of you, I think, who are on the, the call uh, knew him and uh, maybe had children that have his students, uh, heard him speak and teach. And uh, we're going to hear a little bit more about, about him uh, in, in just a little bit um, from, uh, from Steve. Um, if, if everyone who will be participating should have a copy of this book, you won't need it for today, but um, if you don't have a copy, uh, just email um, the Young Israel office. And uh, I don't know the exact price, but we'll be buying copies from Maimonides uh, and, and can, uh, can get one from you, at least if you're local. If you're not local, we'll we'll figure it out. But um, uh, you have to follow with the original edition, Rabbi Hellman. I'm but, not so I, I I'm uh, I think so. I think oh, so. The, the current edition <laughs> was made from uh, the word files that were that the original edition. Maybe not the very literally the very first, but at least the. the I think the, I have that copy also. Does everyone have? Is everyone everyone has the other one? No. No. <laughs> we, we have one that says pre-publication. It, it, the page numbers may be different, but I believe that the entire content is identical. Like. Okay, so we'll. So I think it's. I think either one will be fine. If there's an issue, we'll 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 figure that out then. But I, I, I think everyone. Also, I can also uh, uh, some sort of have control over the copyright current material. Yeah. I could also send out to the rabbi uh, you know, some some uh, pages uh, if it's critical. If it's if it is critical. Yeah, so th th there are many people who have many different uh, connections here. I will just point out, at least this edition, I don't know if it's in the other one also, is, is uh, uh, dedicated by Kenny, who's, who's uh, with us and his sister, member of, of their parents. So that's uh, another special uh, connection and merit uh, for us. And, and uh, we get to learn from the book dedicated to, uh, to, to Kenny's parents. And uh, again, so my plan is, but we'll, we'll see uh, how this goes and, and if people have suggestions, but it'll be sort of like a, a, a book club. I mean, we'll, we'll, you know, say the next class we're going to be, we'll talk about chapter one, let's say, and uh, it won't be necessary, but it, maybe we'll be encouraged for everyone to, to read that chapter beforehand, but again, not necessary if you don't have time that week. And uh, we won't be able to go through every word and every paragraph of every chapter, but uh, if you have a question about something or there's a certain issue you'd like to hear a little bit more about, you can email me before the upcoming class and I'll make sure to include that. And if not, I'll pick out what I think are the, the most important ideas from the chapter or, or areas where I think I can add something uh, or just explain a little bit more. Um, but we'll just go through the book um, uh, more or less more or less in order. That's the, that's the plan. Um, that's the plan now. Um, just a very brief introduction before uh, Steve's going to have most of the, the time today, and you'll hear why. He's really done a, a lot, a lot of work uh, and knows a lot about Ray Wolgamuth, and, and it'll be a good way to, to introduce the class, to begin the class. Um, but just a, a very brief thought about learning about the Siddur. Um, Maimonides School and Rabbi Wolgamuth's class was the exception, but most don't study um, rigorously in an organized fashion, the Siddur and Davening. Uh, but the truth is that, um, you know, uh, there's maybe few topics that are more deserving um, of our study to make sure we, we understand it and, uh, and the depths of it. Uh, the source for the mitzvah of Davening is the Pasuk, will avdo and you shall serve him, Hashem. That's the Pasuk in Shema. You'll serve Hashem with your entire heart and your entire soul. On a simple level, that just means you should live a Torah life. You should live a Jewish life. You should uh, dedicate your, your heart and soul to Hashem as that is expressed in every area of life and every stage of life. It's just a, sort of a general command, serve God. But uh, our sages had a tradition that it had a specific meaning what is the service that takes place in our heart? Zutfila, that is 
um, prayer. That is that is davening on the one hand because that is the the mitzvah that really can capture our entire heart and we can put our entire heart into it. But also because the pasuk is true on both levels. It's a general command, serve God with your entire heart, with all of your experiences, with your entire personality, with your whole life, and serve him in prayer because prayer is the mitzvah. Prayer is the place where our entire life as an Eved Hashem um, finds expression. Shofar, lulav, matzah, that captures one feeling, one idea. But uh, davening, a lifetime of davening, uh, will capture it all of life, ups and downs, doubts, questions, requests, thanksgiving, joy. Um, all of that is, uh, is expressed and finds place in davening, at least at some time, at some point in our life. So that is the mitzvah that sort of our whole life um, uh, is... Uh, is uh is captured is is um distilled in terms of serving Hashem. So there's nothing more important than davening, and so there's nothing more important to learn about than davening. And uh, luckily, we will have this incredible book, whatever edition, to sort of guide us through that. And uh, hopefully, these classes will also just be a great opportunity for people to see each other near and far, uh, and uh, and to talk about meaningful things. And uh, I look forward to, I'm sure, I, I have no doubt that I will learn a lot in these classes from Roy Wolfmuth and from you as well. And so I'm looking forward to it very much uh, as well. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to give the floor to, to Steve. And um, I'll really let him explain uh, sort of his connection and, uh, and why he is so involved. And uh, as you'll see, he really has a lot of very interesting and very important things uh, to share with us. So today's sort of like an introductory class this is gonna be different than most classes. And uh, we'll, we'll hear from Steve for most of the time. Okay, thank you, Rabbi. Uh, what I wanted to do, uh, talk about a number of subjects related to the book. And then let me give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about my understanding of how this book came to be written and came to be a book that the OU Press is now adding to it, will be adding to its uh, catalog of books. Uh, and since there are some members of the Kahila who are listening into this, uh, like Mark Blechner in particular, who were involved in the beginning of the uh, conversion of Abba Wolverine's personality and Torah that is brought in class to a hardcover book. Uh, if anybody has material or corrections to my understanding of the history, uh, please get in touch with me either directly or if we have time at the end of the meeting. And in particular, I want to get back to you, Mark, and discuss a couple of items you raised. So I'm going to talk about how uh, this book came to be. I'm also going to update you on where we the OU Press book uh, is with the publisher and how what is being worked on and how it differs in significant ways from what the Kahila uh, and what Namani School have published so far. I want to spend time in walking you all through the Safaria website because there are several items on the website that are particularly important to this class that Rabbi Elman has started and also in particular uh, information that will add more flesh to uh, our understanding of Rabbi Wolverine's Torah and his course. Uh, I will also take some time uh, on the website, the Savari website is about a 25 to 30 page history that I've compiled about Rabbi Wolverine and his family, uh, as well as uh, uh, echoliniums about Rabbi Wolverine that were written over the years. Um, and I want to uh, share some uh, very salient points of his life history uh, that we as a community may not be aware of. And in particular, uh, knowing the kind of person he was, unaware of the tragedies that he was exposed to in the 30 years prior to his, I mean, the 10 years prior to his immigration year. And then uh, as this 
all of our privileges, Rabbi Hellman suggested how we might uh, want to organize, how he intends to organize the course. In particular, I want to call everybody's attention to the prologue and the epilogue of the current edition and make a case for each and every one of us to reread the material and start uh, our studies there. And in the epilogue, in these, for example, in particular, there's some of Rabbi uh, Wolgama's uh, actual exposition of prayer and the Rob's comments on some of them. So it's more than just the content of the epilogue, but I want to in particular talk about that. Well, uh, it takes a community uh, and it takes uh, Hashem's hand to make something like this book, the print copy of this book to, to exist. Several years ago, Rabbi Hellman and I approached the OU Press about publishing Rabbi Waldo's Guide to Jewish Prayer. Uh, and as an aside, one of the things that uh, Abe Katz and, and um, Mike Rosenberg and I did in particular is we took out the uh, uh, pronoun A and we used on the cover, and I would want to refer to the book as Rabbi Isaiah Waldo's the ultimate guide to Jewish prayer as one long title. The OU Press enthusiastically agreed. Once published by OU Press, this invaluable work will remain widely available to the Jewish community for many, many years, which is our goal. In an effort to preserve the value of the Mamadi Priori at the field of curriculum for the future and to make it more widely available as a resource, Rabbi Wolgamuth determined to transform his curriculum into a book. As he approached retirement, Rabbi Wolgamuth enlisted the aid of Rabbi Asher Reichert, a student of his from the Mamani's class of 1967. Over six years, they spent many afternoons in Brookline together as Rabbi Wolgamuth dictated from his Maimonides lecture notes. Together, they revised and reorganized the material. After Rabbi Reichert went on Aliyah, Rabbi Wolgamuth came to Harnoff for three summers where he and Rabbi Reichert continued writing and editing. When Rabbi Wolgamuth's health began to fail, Rabbi David Shapiro, then retired as the principal of Nanadi and other members of Kahila joined in the final editing in an effort to accelerate the process. Rabbi Waldemuth read and approved of all the texts they produced. Later, Joel Robinson, a Maimonides Kahola member, self-published this first edition of Rabbi Waldemuth's Guide to the Jewish Prayer in 2001. And it's my understanding that over those years, following 2001, that nearly 2,000 copies were sold, not just one locally. Rabbi Reichert, however, still had much additional material it was not included in the edition published by Joel Robinson. Rabbi Reichert and Rabbi Wolgamuth discussed the details and overall, overall scope of the project and how to include the additional material. Rabbi Wolgamuth gave Rabbi Reichert very specific directions for the, those parts of the book that they didn't get to finish. Rabbi Reichert looked forward to when he could take the time to finish the project and do justice to fulfilling Rabbi Wolgamuth's vision. It would be more than 20 years before this goal could be realized, during which time, in 2008, Rabbi Wolgamuth passed away. So although I could create a reprint of Rabbi Wolgamuth's book for my grandsons in New York City, which was my original goal, my personal goal, I was concerned that if the book were to go out of print again, which it had, and if Joel Robinson and I weren't around, Rabbi Wolgamuth's important work would no longer be available. It seemed to me that if the Mamani School were involved as publisher, that would ensure the continued availability of the book. I contacted Mike Rosenberg, the business and development officer at Mamani's then, to discuss with him the possibility of making the book available again. He told me that he had received many requests for copies of Rabbi Wolgamuth's book. Rabbi Waldemuth's son, Shlomo, granted permission for his father's books to be edited, annotated, and republished. Shlomo Waldemuth approached Abe Katz, a 1971 Mamadi's graduate and a student of Rabbi Waldemuth, to be involved in the project. 
Abe had established the Biori Hatfield Institute online to assist educators in developing courses on Tefillah. Abe reviewed the entire manuscript. Joel Robinson had sent me the original Word files. Abe uh, reviewed the entire manuscript and enhanced the edition with an index and many additional footnotes to clarify Rabbi Wolgamus' commentary. Together, Abe Katz, Mike Rosenberg, and I produced the second edition of Rabbi Wolgamus' Guide to Jewish Prayer, published by Maimonides School, which appeared in print in July 2014. Kenny Whitman provided considerable seed money to the label Maimonides to purchase books to put on sale. While the 2014 edition of Rabbi Waldo's book was a noteworthy achievement, I felt that the ultimate goal should be to publish an edition of the book edited by Rabbi Asherah together with all the additions, modifications that he had discussed with Rabbi Waldo and that were not included in the 2014 edition. Also, Mamanis is not in the book selling business, so it's been a not a mainstream activity by the by the school for sure. In the fall of 2017, my grandson Shmuel Denker entered, entered Yeshiva Rashi in Beit Shemesh, Israel. He, he brought along a hard copy of the 2014 edition of the guide for Rabbi Riker and his wife Rashi. Rashi at the time was the Rashid's uh, office manager. Years before, when they were here in the United States, Rashi Reichert and my wife Elaine taught together in pre-kindergarten at Maimonides. In my reply, in his reply to my suggestion that we embark on the project of editing, updating, and expanding Rabbi Wolden's book, Rabbi Reichert pointed out he had just retired. He had just retired and agreed and stated, I have been and I am committed to finishing this project as soon as I possibly can, as correct as I can make it, and consistent with what I believe Rabbi Wolgamus had intended. By the way, I said he just retired. After several years of dedicated work, and it's been about two and a half years now of strong editorial work, Rabbi Walker and Mrs. Riker, his wife, have finished their manuscript which they turned over to OU Press, yes. and it is extensively, extensively expanded to include unpublished authors' notes and supplementary material. So let me tell you something about the book, something to look forward to. The current book is less than 300 pages. The manuscript, as the Reicherts, and they are really co-editors, the Reicherts submitted uh, to OU Press is 600 pages, over wow. twice as large, 600 pages. All the royalties in the contract for the book, all the royalties in perpetuity, 100% of all the royalties will go directly to support Mamani School. Nowhere else. Kenny Whitman has generously taken on the responsibility of the major fundraising, the major funds rather, supplying the major funds as a donation to make this book possible to pay for the editorial costs and the uh, set up and all the other things that go together with putting a new book together. Uh, and without that, the OU Press would have to go out and either raise money somewhere else or we would have maybe difficulty in publishing it. But Kenny's generosity is gonna make that not a problem. The book is 600 pages or thereabout. It has 2000 footnotes. The 365 uh, review questions that Rabbi Logan has developed uh, for his students when he was teaching the course at Maimonides have been integrated into the book. There will be a, a note at each, for each question where in the book exactly that subject is described. And if in the future the book uh, is released as an ebook, those would be hyperlinked so students could go back and forth. Since many of the uh, points the Rabbi Logan makes in the book, because of his many years as part of the Rav's Kahila at Maimonides and their, coll their collegiality, the Rav is cited many places. And so the new book will have a specific index telling the reader where the Rav's comments are located 
So somebody who, independent of the text, wants to know what the ROP is commenting on and where he's commenting on it, the index will tell them to that page. The, uh, the rabbi, Reichert, and his wife have added a very comprehensive davening chart so that for each holiday uh, and each uh, situation of special tefillah, uh, the exact pages in, in, uh, in Sidur and in other, elsewhere and in the Torah and other sources will be cited. Uh, to currently, we checked, Kenny and I checked with the OU Press, and they said they're about 40% done. Uh, it's a it's a daunting task because I'm sure uh, just as Abe, Asher checked many of uh, Abe Katz's citations for footnotes, I suspect that Rob, Rabbi Krakowski uh, and others are checking each and every one of the footnotes. So I expect those footnotes are going to be robust. They're going to be very useful. So that's the story so far. And as I say, it's a community, has been a community effort, and those people who have participated, who I haven't thanked or I'm unaware of, I want to thank because it's been a wonderful privilege to be able to share Rabbi Goldman's story. Let me tell you some of the things that are on Safari and why they're important. Um, we put most of this material up at the end of 2019. And probably late this spring or during the summer, uh, Rabbi Huff, uh, the Judaic principal at Maimonides and I will be going through my uh, material, which I created uh, or copied to this site, uh, make sure that it makes sense and that it's valid. So right now, it's still to be considered a draft. And if anybody going on that site catches an error or uh, a misstatement or something that's not clear, please let me know because I want to keep it current. Uh, on the site is the uh, form, the short uh, one page summary biography of Rabbi Wogamuth that appears in the rear cover of the current edition and appeared on earlier editions. Uh, it also contains a description of the, uh, the, some of this material, let me go back a moment, some of this material was taken directly from the Hebrew Sefer Makarot that Rabbi Wogelman prepared for his students and gave them the beginning of their uh, journey with him uh, in studying tefillah. Uh, the, uh, there is a preamble to that book that Rabbi Wogelman wrote that's on the site. Uh, there are, are the 365 clan questions and without knowing exactly what to call them, I call them his lesson plans and we put the material up in November of 2019, and there have been over 1,600 views of those uh, questions. Um, and there have been over 1,200 views of the preamble that he wrote to the Sage from Macro. There is a compendium of books on tefillah that I found uh, over two years, and I would, want, would welcome uh, anybody who goes on that site and sees a, a book that's missing. Uh, send me an email and I'll add it. Uh, the start of the list of books on Tefillah are the two books that Rabbi Walden cites in his explanation of the course that he gave at Maimonides. One is Rabbi Baer's uh, Sitter and, and Commentary on the, on the uh, uh, Sitter, which I understand several classes used as a textbook. And I, was, I got one copy out. It. It's over a thousand pages. They're all in the Greek. And another book that he used is a book that's published by the Jewish Publication Society by uh, Rabbi Elbogen, uh, who's a reform rabbi, and in particular, uh, in Rabbi Elbogen's introduction to his guide, he mentions how the Rav specifically said that those were two books to, to look to, and that Elbogen, even though he was a, a reform rabbi, gave a very good and fair exposition of the Orthodox point of view. There is now also on the website a 1991 interview that the rabbi, video interview that Rabbi Wogamuth did with the uh, Holocaust Witness Program. Uh, and it's hosted by the, uh, it's, it's, there's a link, so you don't have to go to the site, but it's hosted by the Brookline uh, uh, TV channel. 
And it's an excellent uh, interview. It tells a lot about his own family history and his view of what he was going through. And I look forward to, Mark, I look forward to looking at that video uh, interview that you uh, did uh, on your own, because maybe we can put that up as well. And I think that together they would probably tell quite a story. There are also on the site um, the scan, scan pages from the Safer Macro, the Gomorrah pages, the Rambam pages, and so forth. Uh, the uh, Rabbi Wolgamuth gave 1988 lectures, I think six evenings, to the uh, Maimonides Kehillah, and those are those tapes are also on the site. And uh, I personally must admit that I haven't gone through them entirely, but the very first one. And if you open up the book that you currently have, the very first one, which was given uh, while the book was still uh, probably even before it was actually started, it sounds it sounds like he's reading it from the book. So he must have had the book in his mind all the time. Um, there are some other things there as well, and one of the things in there that I want to talk about uh, is the twenty-five uh, to my draft twenty-five to thirty page. The history of Rabbi Wolgamuth's life, his family life. And so I'd like to share with you some of the salient points. Um, and I probably will update it because when I put it up, I didn't have all the images that I wanted to use. But let me tell you something about Rabbi Wolgamuth's family history. Rabbi Isaiah Wolgamuth was born Yeshayahu Gotel. September 15, 1915. He was the oldest of three sons. He was born in Kitzingen, Germany, and died on January 6, 2008, in Elizabeth, New Jersey, where his son lives. He is buried in the Eretz Rachayim Cemetery in Beit Shemesh, Israel. And if you have an opportunity to go there, um, you'll see that there are many people who visit his grave. And one of the things that he says on one of the uh, citations on his grave, and I can't pronounce it in English, I'll say it in English, is where in the Gomorrah it says that anybody who educates a young child is the soul he was the parent. And so in a way, uh, Dave Katz, Mike Rosenberg, Kenny Wintman and I are, look, I look forward to the privilege of being the an additional parent to many children, the children who have been reading his book, in addition to, of course, the Torah and book and teachings of Rabbi Bogan of the Blessed Memory. In 1865, January 1865, the Jewish community in Kitzingen was officially organized. There were, there were to be only four district rabbiners serving the Jewish community in Kitzingen. Emanuel Adler, was the first. He served from 1868 to 1911. Joseph Wolgamuth, Rabbi uh, Wolgam, Rabbi Wolgamuth, Rabbi Wolgamuth's father, served from 1914 to his untimely death in 1935 from acute appendicitis. For three years, 1935 to 1937, Rabbi Sigmund Hanover, who lived in Wurzburg nearby, served as the official district rabbiner. But Rabbi Wolgamuth himself, who, had, who was in the process of finishing his studies at the Hildesheimer Yeshiva in Berlin, he served de facto as the rabbi of the congregation. And in 1937, at the age of 22, he was raised to the role of district rabbiner, an official position in Germany. And he served See. until he fled. Maybe Mark, were you going to say something? Now, Steve, if you could speak a little uh, more loudly. I'm sorry. A little soft. If maybe if everybody muted themselves, uh, if you mute everybody, Rabbi, it would be clearer. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do that as well. I apologize. In old age, I'm getting to talk too soft. My wife keeps complaining too. From 1937 to 1939, Rabbi Waldemar served as the official uh, district rabbiner. 1939 was when he fled Germany. Uh, the primary reason for the uh, for the congregation growing and becoming an establishment in 1865 was at the initiative of the local uh, 
rabbi, the local mayor, it's in wine, that part of Bavaria is wine country. And he wanted to make it possible for the wine merchants and the wine businesses and wholesalers and vintners uh, to come to uh, locate in uh, Kitzinger. And they, they did. The community grew for many years. In 19, 1871, there had been 19, 97 Jewish residents. By 1910, there were 478. But in 1933, there were only 360 residents. Crystal Lock was the tragedy that struck all of Germany and it struck Kitzinger as well. If you have a chance to listen to Rabbi Lodema's uh, video interview, he talks about what life was like up until that point and um, after that point. And of course, Rabbi Wolkema was a young man. When he left Germany, he was only 24. And he lived in an apartment building with young German families. And some SS officers were dating girls in his building. He talks about uh, how he handled that as a young man in the same building. Tragically, November 10th, Kristallach came to Kitzinger. 57 Kitzinger Jews were arrested and held prisoner in the large hall of the district court. On the way to the district court, they were abused and mocked as their trucks drove past the burning synagogue. They heard the cry of the gathered crowd, throw them into the fire. The sick and the old were soon released. The rest were brought by trucks to prison in Würzburg. 23, including Rabbi Wolgamuth, were subsequently deported to Dachau. Rabbi Wolgamuth was in one of those trucks. Between 1933 and 1941, 994 Jews left their hometown to other destinations across Europe and the United States. Uh, in April, 19, in April, 76 were deported to uh, Izbica near Lubin Perlund, and April 24th, 19 were sent to Theresienstadt. After Crystal Knot, um, the Jewish residents were brought, brought, brought to a building complex owned by the Jewish congregation. In, during that time, uh, Rabbi Waldo's mother, uh, who was uh, born in 19, 1892, so she was a young woman, uh, was teaching English. Her, one of her sons, and I'm not sure how he got how he left, but one of her sons, Rabbi Waldo's next brother. Uh, emigrated to Palestine uh, and lived his life out there. And I know the family is still there. And I believe some of the family has written and studied the family history independent of my work. Uh, the family, they were born, they were married, uh, to say around the time, uh, I'm not sure if I know here, they were married around 18, uh, 1935. Um, Rabbi Waldman's youngest brother, Leo, and his mother were received documents to emigrate uh, to London two weeks before World War II started. And so they were stuck and uh, they didn't get out. The synagogue, uh, although the synagogue was uh, severely damaged uh, on Crystal Isle, uh, it was used during the war and so the building was not torn down. And in the uh, many years later, the synagogue, after World War II, the synagogue was uh, fully restored. Um, there is, a, as I understand it, maybe Mark has been there, uh, the, there is a small uh, uh, study hall or, or synagogue within the synagogue, but it's used primarily uh, as a community building. Uh, during world, during the uh, occupation of Germany after World War II, up until just a few years ago, there was a United States Army base and the Jewish uh, soldiers did use a synagogue. So on the website, there's a picture of the synagogue. The outside is beautiful. I don't have a picture of the inside. I believe on the website, I've included a black and white picture of the inside of the synagogue. Um, it turns out if you Google it, 
there is a company that produces you know, uh, cross uh, jigsaw puzzles uh, of important buildings or beautiful buildings in Germany. And one of the puzzles is the uh, Kitzingen Synagogue. So I recommend, you know, that if you have time, that you look on the site and take a look at the history and some of the other material. Now, what, what to study? If I were studying the book for the first time, I would recommend that you read carefully Rabbi Waldman's prologue and Rabbi Waldman's epilogue. The prologue describes what happened as a young, you know, it's a man who was barely over 20, age 20. Um, and, uh, oh, I know one thing I didn't say. When he was growing up in Kitzingen, he went to the, uh, he got, his formal education was in the German school system. And as he says in his biography that he gives online in the video, uh, his, his high school teacher in the gymnasium recommended him to the university. And Rabbi Wilma says, oh, because he was not a Nazi and he was a Huguenot. And he probably got into trouble for it, but Wilma knew that he wasn't going to go there. He spent a year at the Tel Yeshiva before he went and received his visa and education at the Osaka Yeshiva. Excuse me. So in the prologue, Rabbi Wilma, this new young rabbi with no real pulpit experience, but knowing the kind of speaker and teacher he was, it's not surprising. He became the leader of the congregation and gave many important opportunities to the congregation for learning, sermons and encouragement and so forth before he personally also had to flee. Um, and so his, his prologue, in the prologue, he talks about it as the best of times, the worst of times, and why he said it was the best of times in terms of the intense Torah study of his, of his community. So it's a song of, of love and hope. And it's a beautiful, beautiful essay. The epilogue itself follows up in the theme in a different way. The epilogue is really a, a very thoughtful and powerful polemic against assimilation. A very powerful and polemic, polemic against assimilation. And since this is supposed to be a group of folks interested in studying Rabbi Waldemar's Torah and Rabbi Waldemar's instruction on, on prayer, in the epilogue on page 264 of the Maimonides edition is an opportunity to learn some uh, Torah and learn some uh, knowledge about, learn, learn some uh, information about, uh, to feel I think Ruth Beck commented me, to me that she had found that recently and appreciated it. Um, and also in there, you'll see how he integrates his own insights into prayer with several comments by the Rob. And so you'll see throughout the entire book in the old edition and in the OU Press edition, a considerable amount of commentary by the Rob. So I anticipate, although it was my intent in getting the book printed for my children, and my intent uh, in contacting OU Press is for the book to be used in day schools in yeshiva throughout the world, the Jewish day schools in yeshiva throughout the world, not only Orthodox, but Reform and anything that has to do with, with Jewish education. Uh, that, uh, what's my thought? You know, I'm seeing that. <laughs> anyway, all I'm saying is that, uh, the, oh yeah, I remember. It's for the kids, primarily. Are you present talking about printing it? You're talking about the first edition, at least their first edition, being a paperback, so they can keep the cost down. But it, there are multiple commentaries throughout the book because of the Rav. Of course, the Rabbi Wolde was bothering with the Rav and being a colleague of his and a major teacher at his school. There are many comments in the book, throughout the book. This is what the Rav does. This is why the Rav does it. This is the way other folks do it, and so forth. So, I anticipate that if the OU Press does their job in properly merchandising and talking about the book and getting the right reviews and the right publications, and also by word of mouth, that this will also become a major book in the hands of adults. And those of us who use it as students and 
get our copy dog eared and messed up, we'll go out and buy a copy of the book. And then, like I have done, we'll go out and buy several copies and send them to their grandchildren that they have to deal with online or locally so they can all study to feel it together. So I'm so happy that uh, Rabbi Hellman and you folks have decided that you want to study Rabbi Wogan's Torah. You studied Rabbi Wogan's book on Tefillah. And I look forward to learning a lot by listening and participating myself as well. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, does anyone have any questions for Steve about Rabbi Wolgamuth's life? Any any follow up questions uh, before? Um... No. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to give everyone extra homework for this coming time, and uh, I'm going to encourage everyone uh, to to read the prologue and epilogue, like Steve said. Um, uh, and um, again, if you don't have a copy, you want a copy, just, just email the office. Uh, but in addition, um, we are gonna talk also about chapter one. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty short chapter. And at least in my edition, it goes from page seven to, to 14. Okay, so you don't need to re read it in advance, but um, uh, if you do, I think uh, you know, we'll, we'll all get even more out of it. And again, if there's, um, we're not gonna be able to discuss everything that appears in chapter one. So um, if there is something that catches your attention, or you have a question about, um, please email me and I'll make sure to, to cover it in our discussion next time. So next time, we the first time we really begin studying the book. Um, maybe we'll make some comments about the prologue and epilogue, but I do wanna also um, to start the actual content of the book with uh, chapter one. Any, uh, any questions, comments, any suggestions for, for the class or discussion? Yes, Mark. I just wanted, I'm sorry, I couldn't unmute for, fast enough before you started. Um, Rabbi Walgmuth, and I don't know if that was um, part of what, Steve, you've collected. Rabbi Walgmuth in the 50s was the rabbi of the young Israel of Greater Boston, which was on Ruth yes. Street around the corner from the old Maimonides. Um, I only recollect my father, Zichron Levracha, was um, the president for a while, and I was sitting up on the stage at that time. If we could find anyone who was older than um, myself, that uh, possibly in their 80s, that davened there, that would have would like to sit down and possibly recollect anything of teaching that Rabbi Walmuth did as, as his first stellar, so to speak, outside of Germany, it may be very interesting. And it may be a segue into how and when he got involved with the Rav to, to um, chart this course at Maimonides. Yeah, I do have some material there. Um, I mean, my, what comes to mind, the person that comes to mind is the Millen boys. One just passed away, unfortunately, a few weeks ago. But maybe his brother uh, it, it would have some recollection. And there was another fellow there. I don't know if he's still alive. His brother is in my, was in my class from the Posick family that davened there. Unfortunately, Arnie Bramson, who lived around the corner from the shul and would have davened there, has passed away also. Uh, I do discuss that material, some of that material in the book. Um, and in it just would be a good online, On the online um, history of the family, I just ask it. His wife also was involved in, in the uh, schools at that time as well. Uh, some of this material came from the book, the, uh, the book that was published about the Rav, um, and some of this material was, was published in the Left Book and, and on some other books as well. Um, Rabbi Walden, uh, let's see here. Um, it was the Lubavitch. Um, they were the two of them were married. In 1943, they were both naturalized in 1944. I think Shlomo, they uh, adopted Shlomo uh, and arrived in the United States sometime after 1946. Um, and uh, in 1944, uh, Yeshiva or Israel uh, hired, uh, opened an elementary school, and uh, Rabbi Wogan was their first. Uh, uh, was, was there, was one of the first people there, and also his wife was involved with the, the school for girls, with the 
principle. So some of that's in there, and the people see that and know more about it than what I was able to find. I really would love to hear from it. Mark, can, sometime in the next couple of days, would you give me a call? And I'd like to talk to you about uh, what you have, especially that uh, tape. See if we can do it out, getting it onto the, onto sure. the screen. Sure, sure. Thank There's just so a question in the chat, Miriam. The, the, the prologue and epilogue, do they, are, is that not in the first edition? No, it's not. Oh, I can, I can send you an electronic copy, copy, Rabbi, which you can make available as a link. Sure. Um, well, I'll, I'll email you that because it's, it's, I, I what I used to create, what uh, Abe Katz and I used to create the Mamani's edition came directly from the, uh, Word file that uh, I got, uh, and I think the, the book may have gone through two two revisions before of them. The first group, I think there was a very first one that came out almost instantaneously, and I think there were two or three possible revisions of that. So I had the mind revision already had the prologue and the epilogue, but in the edition that was published before we published the Maimonides edition, the introduction to the course. At Maimonides that Rabbi Wolgamoth wrote about Rabbi Kohn starting the course, et cetera, et cetera. And the pro, what I call, what Abe and I call the prologue, were merged. And I divided that into two parts because Rabbi Wolgamoth's essay, and it's divided in the book as two parts, current book, and the new book goes well. I separated out the story about how this course got studied, started at Maimonides from Rabbi Wolgamoth's experience in Kitzingen prior to his moving to the United States, because that's a very different essay than just how the course got started. It in and of itself is very powerful, but it's different. And so the okay, prologue so we'll, we'll, that we'll send out is, is just the prologue. Yeah, we'll get, we'll, so we'll make all that, we'll, we'll figure out the best way, Miriam, to make yeah, it. I, yeah, they're very small files, because they're just, they're just the text files. So I'll send them out to you, Rabbi, as one file, and you can decide how you want to share it. Anyway. And Rabbi, okay, great. Great, great. There's also a pre-publication copy that I have, which doesn't have an epilogue, but has an introduction. It's undated. It's hard. Is, to is it white cover, plain cover? White cover, like this. Yeah, yeah. That I don't know. I don't know too much about the very early editions. Uh, we had a white cover, 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 copy, copy, and uh, but I used I used what uh, I got from. Uh, uh, I have two. I have. Um, I have two copies. I have to find them. The two copies um, that look like an old ad, Maimonides ad book with the black spiral binding. Yeah, I have a white spiral binding. Yeah. White a lot spiral. Of, there were a whole bunch of editions from the beginning, uh, and there was a Mark, Mark. You know more than I. There was a lot. There were a lot of authors involved with getting the first editions out, and. One of the things that gives me a great deal of pleasure is that uh, I felt Asher Reiter make his peace with the Kahila because there was a lot of intense feelings and of ownership on the part of people involved, some of the people involved in the first edition. And what I was able to do, thank God, through the intervention of my grandson, Shmuel, God bless him, who was at Rishi for two years, if I might brag. Uh, that by him bringing a copy personally, even though he had seen the book and he didn't really want to look at it, giving a personal copy to Rabbi Rocket, he, he said, I am now energized, got over his, his, his residual resentment and anger that other people had, were taking ownership of his, of his book with Rabbi Logan. Uh -huh. And the pride of ownership, the pride of authorship, and the, and the truth that he deserves for what he did overrides, in my opinion, the fact that he, he felt bad. But now he, now I can assure the Kahila and everybody who's involved in, like you, Mark, for example, that Asher is, Asher is very, very, very happy and pleased that now the book will be what he and his heart always wanted it to, to see it to be. And, um, so it's now, Hashem really made this happen. It was, you know, a lot of things went on between now and the time that Rabbi Lohan started the course. Uh, this is a book that people like Mark and Kenny 
and many others, like Rosenberg and uh, many others, deserve a great deal of affection and admiration for what they did and how they did it. It wasn't easy. Producing a book, as I have found out, uh, is not a trivial job, even if it's a trivial book. But this is no trivial book, I assure you. We, we thank you, Steve. And any other um, uh, questions, comments about Rosemuth, what we're going to be doing, the book? <coughs> okay. The, the, the Gemara is a phrase that when we study the Torah of someone who passed away, Sif so sav dovos becover, his lips, so to speak, are moving uh, in the grave. So um, uh, even just speaking about him and, and uh, fondly remembering him, I, I never had the merit to know him. Uh, today is, is a great merit for Rory Wilgamuth, but certainly when we will begin to start actually uh, studying his book. So um, Thank you. Thank uh, we, you will, we, we will start with chapter one next time. If you have the prologue or epilogue, we'll try to send that out also. So try to look at that. Um, but uh, chapter one, we're going to, uh, as they say, uh, begin at the beginning. And, um, and again, again, if you have any, anything you want to highlight before next class, let me know. Uh, if not, I'll, I'll pick out what I think are, are some of the key points. And uh, we'll continue next week. Um, is, is this being recorded? This is being recorded. We got a few requests for it to be recorded, people who can't make it at 2 o'clock. So all the, I, I apologize, I should have said that at the beginning. Um, uh, um, I hope uh, no one has any, um, yeah, I'm okay. it's, it's, I hope that's not a problem for anyone, but we are planning on recording all these classes and they'll be uploaded uh, you know, to the Young Israel website slash YouTube page. So um, for those who can't make it, or if you miss a class, you'll be able to listen as well. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everybody. Okay, thank you everyone. Have a great day. It's great seeing everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Okay. Bye. Next week, chapter one. Okay. Bye bye.